now that you've talked at length about the Indo-Pakistan dimension of the issue, Balakot and Pulwama. The Pulwama raises two issues. One is that we use that as the reason for creating or attempting to create a new normal, which you said has been, we have reached a stalemate on that. But we, we did that. But there is another side to Pulwama also. So far, all the investigations that have carried out, they brought out the local links. My question is the following, that while attention has been focused on jaish e mohammed and it's the, international, the Pakistani link with it, this entire, the, in, the, 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 the more significant thing or rather the more startling thing is that this was a local involvement which was involved, a, which is noticeable here. There are two questions that come. One is, of course, strictly, how could it go unnoticed? Because an operation like a suicide bombing is not something that can be done in a jiffy. You require a lot of preparation. And there has to be a lot of secrecy. Now, Kashmir is with overflowing with troops and there are five intelligence agencies operating there. None of them were able to do That is one part of it. The other is that it raises a question. Why is it that after 2000, when the last time we heard of a Kashmiri trying to turn himself into a weapon and they attempted to attack the Badami Bagh headquarters of the 15th Corps, if you remember, in 2000, it failed. But Nevertheless, that was the last time we heard of any Kashmiri trying to enter the field of suicide bombing. This is 2019. After a break of nearly 19 years, you have another incident like this. This raises a question that has, have things deteriorated so much where people would be willing, for whatever reason, out of desperation, hopelessness or whatever, to take recourse to suicide bombing. I mean, why is it that this side of it, where we have talked and all the media and all the focus has been on Pakistan, the focus inside what is happening and where, where uh, uh, insurgency is actually taking place, what the, 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 the lesson of Pulwama do you think we have we, we, we may be making a mistake in ignoring that local aspect of it? I think absolutely. Uh, out of all the options uh, that are available to us uh, of uh, resolving the Kashmir problem, mm -hmm. uh, winning the hearts and minds uh, is the easiest option. It's the easiest option mm. to be exercised, but it's, it, and it, it's, it has, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's in the political realm. Uh, Counterinsurgency operation has got the political aspect, and you do all the political strategy to win the hearts and minds of the people and convince them that uh, it's a futile exercise that they are engaged in. Mm. Mm. The military aspect is to ensure that the mm. writ of the state runs, yeah. development can take place, mm. so that the political will of the state can be imposed. Our, our focus is a mixed bag. We, we focus on the military um, aspect to, so that to bring the situation under control. And we, the politics side, we looked after by allowing the local governments to be elected and letting them function, you know, beginning 96. Mm -hmm. And thereafter, successive governments have, have functioned. But these, um, these local politicians are themselves uh, compromised in terms of corruption, in terms of their commitment uh, to how to solve the various problems. And they have limitations because a lot of grievances that are, that are there, which have become overall, over the years have emerged. Uh, the key is with the center, not with the local, local, local politicians. So the center's initiative was lacking. By 2003, uh, insurgency had about peaked and thereafter the decline started. It was a combined effort. The military strategy was, you know, uh, function, was working. Uh, there was a critical process on, both with Pakistan, uh, you know, by Mr. Bajpai, it had, it had mm -hmm. begun. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, also internally uh, the the local governments were, were functioning as I mentioned with certain mm -hmm. limitations and um, this continued uh, under Dr. Mirmohan Singh and there was a lot of backdoor um, uh, diplomacy going on and track to diplomacy going on and the four point formula had emerged and plus the military had uh, established its uh, uh, total ascendancy and the, by 2010 or so, notwithstanding the 2008 uh, 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 this uh, Yatra agitation, okay. uh, the, the, the insurgency had come to its lowest level since 1990. I think the total number of terrorists were people were counting them in double digits at that time. There were no incidents taking place. And this continued till about 2014 15. Now, this was a lost period. This was a period when a political initiative would have clinked the issue. But once the four-point formula didn't proceed forward with effect from 2007, and thereafter we didn't see much of uh, much uh, activity at that from that point of view, and internally also we did not take something, uh, something symbolic, something to which the people makes the people happy. It may be just a I mean, when, when we talk of autonomy, we start comparing it to the rest of the country. How does it matter? Does giving, give, giving anybody an autonomy, does it really, is it really going to affect the mighty Indian state? If the, if the Naga Peace Accord, of what the little is known of it, okay, what, are the, what, what all mm -hmm. has, been, has been agreed to? I mean, we have agreed to so much for them. And, uh, something similar gestures here and probably better. I'll come to that because that, uh, that is in fact a very interesting uh, area that we should look a little closer. But before, I want to raise, you said that we have to win the hearts and minds of people. I just want to remind you that the doctrine of subconventional operation, which was brought out by the Indian Army in 2006, talked about transforming, and I quote, from that doctrine, transforming the will and attitude of the people. Now, transforming will and attitude is very different than winning hearts and minds because the doctrine goes on to say that attitude takes much longer to change and that it can take from years to decades. Now, we are witness to this in India where counterinsurgency and the Indian Army has been forced to uh, and we've been sent to, to, to pacify people and they have continued for more than six decades in Nagaland, more than <laughs> the 30 years in Kashmir, more than 50 years in Manipur, etc, etc. And yet the disturbed area remains, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act remains and we are close to, we seem to be close to uh, uh, an agreement on the Naga issue, but we don't know whether it will take place or not. It's still in, in uh, we are in uh, suspended animation about the, the, the real outcome of, of the 19 years of ceasefire and talks that we have undertaken. My question to you is that the, if Indian Army uh, describes its operation and its doctrine as transforming the will and attitude of people, how do you win the hearts and minds of people where you are actually projecting and pushing for a more muscular approach? No, uh, I think when the army uh, talks of this, all this is, it is, it is not talking of, it is not really dealing with, uh, it's more focused on the militants. I mean, this is all, uh, this is all, you suppose they have semantics, you know, and jugglery of words. These things are rarely discussed. In fact, if you look at some of the doctrines that we publish, you will probably, and you compare to the coin, um, uh, you know, documents of um, uh, United States, you will find a lot of similarity. These are, these are just theoretical arguments. Uh, to put it simply, what the Indian Army goes for is that our operations must be constructed, uh, must, be, must be done as per the constitution of India as per the law of the land, we must not violate it. Our we must only focus on the terrorists and the people should be looked after. 
In fact, that is why the army starts the Sadbhavna projects, etc., to win their hearts and mind, telling them that our battle is not with you, our battle is with, uh, with the terrorists. So more of what is written in this book is applies to the to the terrorists as such, and not to or to the segment of the population that is actually actively supporting the terrorists. And for the rest of the people, the army is not not really following any such thing. Uh, so it is. Uh, I would like to separate the two, the political strategy and the military strategy. Winning over the hearts and minds of the people be it through good administration, be it through, uh, you know, satisfying their, their, their grievances or their political grievances, uh, education, healthcare, whatever manner you do it, is a political activity. It's nothing to do with the military. In fact, when the military does all this, it is out of compulsion. A at times it works against the local governments because the military takes the credit for doing a lot of things which they are not be able to do. Mm. But that's that's part of our political system. The military aspect, I think we have we have uh, we have won the military battle in JNK many times. And even today the situation notwithstanding Pulwama is not too bad. If you look at it in terms of violence that has taken place in two thousand the periods the period from ninety nine to two thousand three. 2,000, 2,500 militants killed annually. Our own casualties, five, four to 500 every year. So those things have, have uh, uh, there's no such violence of that level. Even the collateral damage of the civilian casualties are much less. So today, we have won the military battle. The political battle is what we have lost. We have not been able to, uh, to think. And for this, it is not only this government, but the previous government are equally to blame. The wasted years, which I was mentioning mm. to you about, are the years from 2000, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, seven to 2014. These are the wasted years because this is the lowest uh, insurgency was at its lowest. Yet we allowed the protests to grow, multiply, and then the PDP government came to power with a coalition with the with the BJP. Now that was something which the which was not liked by the people of the valley in particular mm. rest of the they did not like it they felt betrayed by the pdp pdp and then having but they played long the coalition government both the partners worked at cross purposes against each other they did not follow the common agenda that they had they had agreed to in fact worked uh, hard to scuttle each other, each other's prospects, future prospects in 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 in, in Jammu and Kashmir, and finally, this government uh, coalition government collapsed. Now, this revival of the insurgency is also, I would say, political failure. While it was earlier also, but this political failure in particular revived the insurgency. When the people lost all hope, they said, "Look, we have no uh, future. Nobody listens to us. Nobody bothers about us." And uh, our grievances, whatever they are perceived grievances, they are they are they, are, they have never been never been addressed. And then the Wani case took place, and then the revival of the insurgency took place. And Pakistan also happy to do this because they felt that it is better to uh, better to uh, let the indigenous uh, uh, movement be more more uh, you know take more more prominent. Otherwise, insurgency over the last 30 years has been fought both by um, indigenous terrorists that today predominantly represented by Hezbollah Mujahideen, mm -hmm. HM of uh, Slaudi, mm -hmm. and by jaish e muhammad and lashkar e taiba which are Pakistan-based organizations, and most of the fighters used to come from Pakistan. And you'll be surprised that most of them are Punjabi Muslims. Notwithstanding all the hullabaloo in the press and an odd report here and there, to the best of my knowledge, no one from Sindh, no one from Balochistan, and no one from the frontier has ever operated in Kashmir. Let me let me come back to this question in a different way. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, that. Uh, there have been many occasions 
when military had more or less defeated the militants and brought it to a, uh, to a point where uh, what was needed was a political initiative. Okay? But over the years we see, I mean, if you go by the numbers, you're right. If you go by numbers, the scale of operations, the scale of infiltration, etc., etc., it's much below. It's, it's below those levels that one saw in the 1990s or around the turn of the millennium. You know, the early years, the 1990 to 2000, 2001, 2002 were the peak years. Yeah. So three, to say. three started uh, yeah. earlier. Yeah. And that's when after 2003, Jaish disappears from the scene, etc. And Lashkar becomes weaker and weaker. Its presence becomes weaker. And militancy, in fact, you're right. By 2013, we were saying that there are hardly any more, less than 100 militants left. Now, you have a huge deployment, uh, which was geared to tackle a much larger uh, number of militants uh, in the 1990s. Those numbers have sh had shrunk to 100 or below. Now they have risen to about three, 350. Even that is nothing very significant. But what is significant is in which many defense analysts, including former raw, uh, senior officer in raw, Vapala Balachandran has pointed out, that what is remarkable this time, which was missing in the earlier period, is that you have people coming out in support of the militants, in large numbers at encounter side, which was something unheard of. And it reminded him, he said, of Palestine. Uh, Given this shift in what is happening, it means that the popular anger is much widespread. I mean, the numbers of militants is much smaller and they don't pose a threat. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. But it's the, it's, the, it's the size of the and the popular support for it, which is something that one should be thinking and, and, and focusing on. To come back to your question about winning the hearts and minds, where you pointed that this is the time for it. Do you think that in the pr present context, with the depleting numbers of militants, it's not the militants who pose a threat, it's the popular support which the militants today enjoy, which is something that needs to I, be addressed? I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know the, the 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 what you have said in uh, through your question. I couldn't agree with it. Absolutely, the the especially in the valley, uh, one has not carried out a detailed survey, or it's not so visible in the conditions in the other Muslim-dominated areas, say like Doda. But it's it's a it's a pas It's not a total uh, uh, Muslim-predominant area, or in the areas of Punch and Rajouri. Because up to Nushara, again, there's a little mixed, mixed population. Beyond that, it is, again, predominantly um, uh, Muslim population. Uh, this, uh, uh, especially in the valley, they are visibly, there are very few people supporting, uh, uh, su supporting uh, um, the, uh, uh, rather very few people against the militants, I would say, uh, left. And this has happened because of the frustration that after the insurgency went away, uh, it came down to a very low ebb, uh, as you, uh, 2000, as, as I mentioned, gradual process, but 2013, it was at the lowest level, the, you know, yeah. uh, with no political initiative, with this experiment of BJP and PDP coalition having failed, the people were very frustrated. They felt that we have, they have fought for so long. Every family has lost one member or the other as a collateral damage or as a, who had taken up, uh, taken up arms. So yet they have, nothing has been achieved. And they are back to square A. The total frustration, one part. Second is that uh, Pakistan wanted to indigenize the whole thing. It did not want to be seen that, that bulk of the terrorists who are fighting here are coming from Pakistan. In fact, uh, they, it was in the reports that for, I mean, I'm not now privy to inside information, uh, that at, there was a time when the, uh, for the first time in recent years, the number of local militants actually in, went beyond the number of Pakistani militants, mm -hmm. uh, Pakistani res, uh, citizens who fight here from Punjab. So 
this uh, this frustration uh, and 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 this uh, no political uh, movement forward of any kind the failure of the local governments has totally uh, people feel that well if this is our future then uh, let's be let's be part of it and that is why this this thing uh, in the entire the uh, insurgency in jammu and kashmir barring the initial years when there was a general uh, uh, sort of uh, you know movement mass movement to block roads and other things and women used to come and lay down on the streets when troops used to move out it all stopped by about 92 93 people realized that it is not something going to uh, something uh, they will suffer more if that happens so they stopped that there was a very interesting understanding in kashmir so long as the military did correct operations as per rule of law as per the laid down um, mm-hmm. norms of engagement there was never a protest never and when i was army commander in 2007 and early 2008 there was hardly ever a protest in fact the moment a protest used to take place it was the first sign to us that something wrong has happened either a person has been killed as part of collateral damage mm-hmm. or there has been Uh, some rogue action uh, taken, you know, have, which has happened uh, as a result. Only then the protest used to start. Or there no protest took place. The protest began Amarnath Yatra. Then the 2010 Machil incident, which was the rogue, uh, clear-cut rogue incident for which the CEO and the three, uh, five, four, five Jawans have been given life imprisonment of a unit, I think. Yeah, but it's right. been suspended yeah. by the armed forces. Yeah, but it's all right. But the, it's still it's a pen, matter still pending and going to mm-hmm. be still fought in the in in the Supreme Court. So uh, my point is that that led to protests, and they were those protests were just a shade below uh, the Wani protests. Again, over hundred 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 twenty people uh, died in those in mm-hmm. in those protests. Mm-hmm. So then, Pakistan also saw the advantage of the intifada kind of uh, ki- kind of uh, protests. mass protests this and plus the frustration that set in so they were the 2010 pulwama protests actually uh, brought in a new dimension they also gave the people an idea this is what is happening then came wani and then the protest became more and more it's just symbolic he was a, he was a facebook uh, you know everybody is on facebook there and social media so he was symbolic so then came the protest so this is why and plus the frustration of the people so they, death wish so the people have a death wish the terrorists have a death wish and back i just want to kill that point that you asked me earlier about why this change why the uh, kashmiris had a sufi this thing overall but uh, plus also they did not have they normally do not have the means pakistan ne- never gave them the best weapons they never gave them the you know the expertise they used them as cannon fodder and they felt that the punjabi terrorists would win the battle you know who would come from pakistan mm-hmm. so they were also kept in the background so it's a question of uh, as what has happened in um, iraq and syria is you are well aware what what they have been up to so all those things have been creeping in some flags some propaganda online so there has been a, a, a what should i say a more extreme form of islam has made inroads into this thing and suicide bombing is certainly part of that is certainly can I, part of can i can i intervene here while we are talking about uh, radicalization of islam in in kashmir uh, in the country as a whole and in jammu in particular which has had a much longer history there has been hindu radicalization that has been taking place so why is it that we focus only on one kind of radicalization but never on the other because each feeds into other please remember I and think, especially jammu yeah. and kashmir are I, I, are I, closely I, linked I, and I, yet I yet the army and the senior commanders have never cautioned countrymen about the threat posed by hindu radicalism or hindu fanaticism and growth of it and connected it with this is another question that i have um uh, you have been a stickler for rules and you have been known for it and in, even in it's evident from your writings also 
especially the way in which you, you wrote about uh, uh, the major Gogoi incident, the so-called human shield incident, where you say the army would never be able to live down the shame, uh, that this is something which will haunt the army for a very, very long time. You had pointed that out in your writing. My point is that somewhere, and the army chief came out in support of Major Gogoi and, and held it out as a remarkable, innovative feature uh, of, of counterinsurgency and commended. In fact, he was also given the army chief uh, commendation, also, card. Uh, commendation card for, for this act of it. But you were very upset with this with the human shield. What has changed where from your time to now, the same thing which would not have been condoned then was being held out as something remarkable, innovative and something to be emulated by others? You see, <coughs> radicalization uh, in any religion is, uh, I think, uh, spells ominous potence. Sikh religion, you know, it was, uh, I mean, uh, up to 1980, uh, everybody considered probably the Sikhs are one of the most nationalist people. And then, uh, for reasons which have been written about, mm -hmm. books have been written about it, but uh, in my view, reasons were both economic and religious and poor governance, etc. Standard religions and yeah. same reasons that they're in Jammu and Kashmir, mm -hmm. you know, you see. Uh, and in Jammu and Kashmir, apart from other reasons, there is religion, because they're religious affinity. Mm -hmm. And in India, uh, the Sikhs have always felt that their Sikh identity is under pressure, right? always felt. And then there was a some sort of things happened because of poor administration, because of sponsoring of uh, Janal Singh Bindrawal initially by the Congress and then mm -hmm. by other people. Mm -hmm. sort of. So then suddenly the movement comes up, uh, movement came up and it was a violent movement that uh, uh, lasted almost uh, 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 a mm -hmm. decade. So it's when in any religion, there are, there are enough, uh, after all crusades have been fought by the, by the, by, by, by the Christians. Uh, they have been no less than anybody else. Islam's things are well known. And Sikhs. LTTE. So Sikhs then, uh, having originated from him, predominantly from Hinduism, the Sikhs became, <laughs> you know, so radicalized. And it was there in almost everybody's hearts. They were, you, 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 people were wearing yellow turbans, yellow dupattas, flowing beards and uh, never before um, in, 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 in sort of in last 150 years after the British took over did we ever see this much of revival of, the, of, of Sikhism. Yeah. So it was very bad. So something happens to, what is something similar has happened to Kashmir. So it's a, it's a combo of factors. And I would say that what, what about, you have mentioned uh, uh, Hindu terrorism. Why about, what has happened, why, why has, uh, you know, not Hindu terrorism, Hindu fundamentalism, I mm. would say. That I would say that, uh, I think the background is well known. Uh, there, is a, there is a background uh, of 1000 years of subjugation, which is Islamic rulers played a predominant role. Uh, you know, for a long period before the Brits came. No, my point is slightly different. Yes, we understand the history and what has happened in the past. What I'm talking about is right now, here and now, when we are sitting, we are witness to rad Hindu radicalization yes. taking uh, place simultaneously yes. while we I'll, talk I'll, about only Islamic... I'll, I'll come to that. Because Indians are facing a bigger there problem. Is a, there is, uh, overall, for ideological reasons, uh, even fascism, they look for a common enemy and in one form or the other and they found it firstly to begin with the Jew, you know, then the Russian mm -hmm. and so yeah, on yeah. and this, so communists and all, so you, you will win. I think uh, in India, uh, this, I won't call it fascism, but whatever ideologic, for ideological reasons, uh, the Muslim has been painted as a, as, as, as a, as a common enemy. Um, 
sort of anybody who supports them, anybody who this thing, and because and because Islam over all the world has been associated with terrorism of late, so we have painted him as a common enemy, and uh, that's one. Secondly, what's happening in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, you know, is is is, is, uh, is is another factor. And earlier terrorist attacks of Bombay, etc., have been mm -hmm. other factors, and this has been exploited politically. So a common enemy is this, and then. If we uh, uh, and there is no question of um, they, they said that other political parties have been cozying up to them, they have been looking after them, they have been chaperoning them, mm -hmm. and uh, consequently now they have to put into their place. Once you put into them, put put into their place, everything will, will be good for us. So that is also no. But reasons. why is it that the Indian Army, which has and its senior officers have time and again publicly come out and talked about and expressed concern over spread of Islamic radicalization taking place, etc. They have never once I think uh, while opened their uh, I'll, 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 and voice text, you know, uh, no, it's, it's a, concern you are, over... You are asking me a little difficult question, but I'll answer it. Yes. I'll answer it. See. See, internally in the army, we have a system where we, we have what is called the counterintelligence units and which are based all over the country. They are counterintelligence units, and uh, Colonel Prohit, for example, mm. belonged to one of them earlier. Before he uh, was, when he was mm -hmm. uh, apprehended, he was uh, doing a course. But earlier, he belonged to us. These are called Lesno units, and you know other names. Uh, there is uh, tracking is done. Uh, military intelligence is meant for military purposes. You know, it, it doesn't uh, pass it on to the government. That is the job of the IB. But we do have, we do comment on, we do work out. Okay, look, these are the organizations which are, uh, which are uh, fundamentalist in nature, and they are likely to be causing trouble in future. We only look at it as, a, as what, what may happen in future. Mm -hmm. So, army does keep its uh, uh, finger on the pulse of uh, of such activities in the country. They do it. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as giving advice to the government is concerned. Uh, there is no reason for the army to give any advice to the government the on cautioning this is the public. This is a political matter. Mm -hmm. This is a political matter. Till such time, the government itself perceives a threat from these radicals, or the threat becomes visible. Mm -hmm. uh, the army, uh, we are a, a political army. We, are, we follow the, the follow the whatever the government tells us. Mm -hmm. So we have we we don't not go to the government. Say, Look, this is going to cause you a problem mm -hmm. on on political issues, and then. Other reason is that, well, well India, let's face it, has got 80% of uh, Hindu population. Its uh, majority population is uh, is Hindu. Uh, so everybody is little hesitant to talk about uh, uh, about these things. For example, I mean, look at the case of Colonel Prohit. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that Colonel Prohit was very much involved with radical organizations. And he did uh, play a major role in whatever activities that they were mm. doing. Mm. This was very much checked by by within the army before he was uh, handed over to the to the civil police. Uh, you know, for when they asked for him. And this is uh, this is something I can I have first hand knowledge of this. Uh, that this this is what this is. Now, we didn't go into the details, but this, on the face of it, whatever evidence was, this is what happened. But over the period of time, um, there have been later inquiries which people are reproducing or citing, where the, they say that even the army has exonerated him. He was a undercover, he was doing undercover job to expose these organizations to all. I think all figments of imagination and uh, from, from uh, a downright rogue, Officer who got involved with fundamentalist organizations, he was made into some sort of a hero, and um, then he was once he got bail, of course, he, which he is entitled to, and he has been reinstated. Uh, you know this sort of thing. So this is there is a there 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 is a dichotomy in the conduct of the armed forces also in this, and we have, uh, but as I said, army doesn't get involved with uh, with the uh, with with the political problems, it it only comes in when the government tells us. Like for example, let's say the trouble is brewing in Punjab. Uh, 
I'm, why I'm giving this example? Because this is how it always happens mm. in the 80s. The army would start reporting in the late 70s, late 80s, uh, from whatever it knows, that this is what is happening, this is what is happening. But army will only do it for its internal use. Mm. It'll say, okay, okay Northern Service Command, we should be prepared, we should you know, mm. deal with this, we should be prepared for such eventualities. But we don't really take any action and we don't advise the government on this unless there's a threat to the security of the state. Then we do advise, and then we probably tell them, look, this is likely to cause a security threat to the to the to the to the mm. nation as mm. such. But otherwise, uh, we don't get involved. Otherwise, like for that, then we'll get involved in almost everything. Why not? Why not? Why not say a Gurjar a fundamentalist Gurjar or a fundamentalist, uh, you know, uh, uh, scheduled caste uh, organization and so on.